that game really cleverly and um, uh, handed a big lead over to George Liston for their last fight, which is, you know, can be interesting to see how these teams kick off. So first up then, it's Annie Devereaux on the left-hand side of your screens for Australia, the 19-year-old, up against Mary Cohen of England. Yeah, Mary's done a lot of training over in France recently. Um, it'd be interesting to see what impact that's had on her style. She's she's very good technical friend. She's a good athlete. And she does pulls out a flash very early there, flash attack. And she does actually use that quite a bit. We saw in earlier rounds her, her using that move quite a lot, kind of waiting for the right moment and then trying to catch her opponent unawares. So early score to England. Devereaux's uh, just kind of trying to feel out what uh, Mary Cohn's timing and distance is. Mary came in there at the right moment, I think, but missed her action and uh, Devereaux got her light on. A little bit less sharp that time from, from Cohen. I think she probably went from slightly too long distance, to be honest. England just narrowly missing out on the gold medal match themselves. Beaten in the semi-finals by Singapore, 45 points to 43. So they were very close, but just couldn't quite get over the line. That's right, and that, and that could have a big impact later on in the, the final medal table, of course, which I'm sure we'll be talking about in a bit. And actually, Singapore, who are in the final, only just squeezed past the Jamaica team in the last eight by a single hit, 40-39. That went down to the priority in the last match. So the t the, they were tied at the end of that match at 39 all, and then an extra minute was added. Uh, and Singapore just managed to score that, that uh, sudden death point. Yeah, it was a terrific performance by Jamaica. It was, yeah. They almost pulled out a really, uh, really fantastic result there. Tears was then very young fencer who won silver in the individual fence really well but actually the whole team Caitlin Chan came on in the last fight and pulled back a deficit but Singapore pulled through in the end so back in action now American has just adjusted her hair very good athlete moves very nicely very smooth footwork and there we see that place attack again her kind of trademark hit she came in with a nice change of rhythm there she came in relatively slowly kind of lulling her opponent into feeling that she wasn't going to attack and then changed into a really fast flesh attack Devereaux caught unawares, got her distance a bit wrong. And, and just to explain again the flesh uh, attack you've, you've been talking about that she's been using. Yeah, we, we talked about this yesterday a little bit actually, anyone who was listening um, and watching yesterday. Uh, flesh is French for arrow and you see it again there, exactly the same action. Comes in with a, quite a slow, relaxed step and then a sudden change of pace into the flesh, which is a kind of diving forward movement where you, you get your arm out straight and push yourself forward and your back foot crosses over in front of your front foot. Nice counter-attack to the wrist there from Cohen. And this is a very solid start for England. Australia have to be careful that this doesn't get out of hand. It's still, obviously, it's the first leg of nine, very early days. but And exactly the same action for Mary Cohen. So her trademark hit scored her four points in that match and one counter-attack to the arm to make up the first leg, five hits. Yeah, so we skip on to the second fight. The clock is reset. The target being 45, but as I say, in, in Epi, we rarely get to that 45-point mark. Yeah, I think I think rarely is a bit harsh. Okay, fair <laughs> enough. <laughs> Often we don't get to that mark, I'd say. I'd be interested to see what Australia do now, because the danger is in this situation where you drop behind early, is you get a bit tense and you try and chase the match, and that's not really the answer what they need to do, because it's su such an early stage in this match. They just need to work their way back in, just try and pull back one or two hits each leg, not not just have a kind of steaming forward panic attack. Horvath. Um, looking like a little bit more of a defensive fencer. Just kind of doing some reconnoitering actions, feeling out what, what her opponent's reaction might be if she did an attack. And she fainted to the top of the wrist and then went for a deep lunge to the leg, but didn't quite get the distance right. Hannah Lawrence, also a very experienced competitor, third in the British ranking. Just pushing the Australian back. Oh, they both came together, they both missed, and then Horvath managed to replace her point a little bit quicker than uh, Hannah Lawrence. First score in this leg to Horvath, so she pulls one back. And the match has got quite a good pace about it, they're moving nicely on the piste, jockeying for position, trying to get the distance right. Lawrence going for the parry post. Horvath went for that same feint to wrist and then go deep to a lower line, but uh, Lawrence pulled out the parry but couldn't quite land the repost. A minute gone in this leg, just the one hit scored. The referee will be keeping an eye on the time, but that was a double as Lawrence went for that flesh attack that we saw in the first leg from Cohen, but 
Paul Vatter's ready for it. Got her arm out to score the double hit. In Epe, if you both score at the same time, then you are awarded a point each, unlike the other weapons. Now, that was really nice. Horvath went for that again. Faints a wrist and then go deep. But Lawrence was ready for it this time. Horvath's already tried that twice. Lawrence was ready. And she blocked out the second action and did a nice riposte. So 7-3. England lead. And just moving in and out of distance. Doing some actions on the blade to try and draw a reaction from the opponent. And Lawrence fainting to the wrist. I get the feeling that Horvath would like to be defensive and would like to counter-attack into her opponent, but with that little deficit, Lawrence isn't too bothered about pushing on. And there, a short flesh from quite relatively short distance, and Horvath again picks up the double. That will suit England fine. They'll be quite happy for doubles to get them to the end of this leg um, with that four-hit cushion. So teams trying to reach 45 hits. Oh, very nice change there. Lawrence stepped in, drew Horvath's counter-attack, and then stepped out of distance and hit to wrist. Really good change of tactic. Good intelligent fencing. It's a very composed start from the England side. It is. I mean, it's very aggressive at the beginning from Mary Cohen. She wasn't hanging around. She came out with those really good flesh attacks. Just caught her opponents off guard, who I thought maybe, I think maybe thought she would be a bit more cautious than that. And she's immediately uh, given Australia a little bit of pressure to deal with. And a nice parry riposte in opposition there. So Horvath again went for the lunge attack. And Anna Lawrence took a cart parry. So moved the right hand and moved the hand across the body, blocked the blade. And then keeping contact with her opponent's blade, did a riposte to get one light. Score is 10-4 to England. A very strong, very strong start. And next up, we're going to have Amy Radford taking on Diana Gu. Amy Radford, uh, still a young fencer, only, I think, 20 years of age. She represented Great Britain at the Youth Olympics. Um, about It must be four years ago, yeah, four years ago now. And I think she made a top eight at the World Youth Championships um, as a cadet fencer and under-17 fencer. So a lot of experience behind her, fifth now in the British senior ranking. Gu scores the first one. Amy Radford needs to be nice and sharp on her feet, moving in and out of distance, not making her actions too obvious. These two are fencing at a little bit closer distance than the previous two pairs. And there's a flesh attack from Gu. I think Radford just needs to just open a quarter of a half a step of distance. Because Gu's obviously got aggressive intent in this fight. Nice attack from Radford there. Just nice direct lunge to the arm. Five hit cushion. And the score is moving along quite rapidly. Amy Radford, a southpaw, a lefty. She's very far over to that left hand side of that piece. Yeah, you see that very commonly with left handers, especially in Epe, but they move to the left of the piece. And then for the right hander, it's very difficult for them to come around the outside and hit the outside of the arm. So by moving to the left of the piece, Amy Radford's just blocking out an option for Gu there. It's quite a common tactic for lefties to use. And then you see Gu will then move to the, her right-hand side of the piece to make sure her point's in line. And as Gu came forward, this time Radford was ready with the counter-attack over the top, blocks the blade on the way through, and restores the six-hit cushion. So it's a bright start from Gu, but Amy Radford quickly adjusted her distance and tactics to, uh, to account for it. I don't think she was just 100% ready as she came on the piece. Yeah, and so important to get the tactic, tactics right and understand the distance from the opponent because the, the whole body being a target, it's you know it, it's such a dangerous game to, to go in and you know, any part of the body can be can be Absolutely. struck. Absolutely, yeah, and, and as Gu is actually slightly smaller than Abu Japayist, maybe Amy thought she could close distance a little bit more than she should have done. And again there, she just, I think she's just launching her feint action from too close and giving a bit of an opening that she's not intending to give. So 12-8. Only just over a minute gone in this this leg. It's been a flurry of hits, really. Amy Radford, kind of aggressive intent in the fight. She's pushing forward. And that was better. She was just a little bit further away. And then as Gu launched the flesh attack, she could take a small step back, give herself time to collect the double, which is, I think, what she'd be aiming for when Gu launches that flesh of double. It's fine for England. They can just keep the score ticking over. That time, Radford took a nice power riposte, but then she missed the first riposte. 
Ooh, I think the referee has said that Radford hit the floor. And therefore, he's cancelling out her hit and giving the hit to Goo. I, I think that's actually a mistake from Capricari, the referee. I think Radford did hit the floor, but she first hit her opponent and then later on hit the floor. I think that's very unfortunate for England. And it's that kind of decision which can just put a little doubt in the mind of the fighter. Yeah, I think, you know, you have to keep your composure in that situation. It's difficult for referee. These guys have been working really hard. They've been here working every day for six days, 12 hours a day. And to keep your concentration in three different disciplines, which most of these guys have been refing across that period of time, is really hard. You know, and they're going to make the odd mistake, I think, at the stage of the competition. It's 13-10. Goo goes for that flesh, but because Radford had the right distance that time, she could just step out of the way, take a good parry and riposte, and that was much better, much more composure from Amy Radford on that hip. I think that's going to be a key word in both these epic matches we're going to see tonight. The fencers, when they're on the piece, they need to sometimes just forget the score and just fence nicely, control the fight, have their game plan, whether that's a holding game plan or an aggressive game plan or whatever it may be, but just be disciplined and stick with it. Three hit gap, 14-11 to England. Just under a minute left. Radford on the extreme edge of the piece now. She's in danger of going off the piece there. And that's, she tried to do that parry riposte in opposition I talked about earlier. But Gu managed to angle her blade around the parry. And Amy's just let a few hits slip here. So Australia right back in contention. The gap was six hits at one point. And Bradford again has closed the distance a little bit short. I'm not sure that's the right tactic against Gu. I think she needs to just be more patient, let Gu start. And there you go, step back out of distance. Give so herself a bit more time. Another double hit which brings the third fight to an end. None of them have taken the full time yet, so it's 15-13, but as you say, giving away a few hits from a six-point lead that they had built up through Hannah Lawrence. Yeah, I think if England had gone into this leg now, you know, with that, say, a 15-9 cushion, there's a, there's a big psychological difference for Australia. Um, Horvath, under a little bit of pressure here against Mary Cohen. She, Horvath's the, the third fencer in the Australian team. Mary Cohen's a very strong fencer, and you would probably expect on paper Mary Cohen to, to score more than her opponent in this leg. So Horvath would have come in under pressure and then that could have led to a, an increase in the lead again. But now pressure's off Australia. They don't have to chase this fight. Horvath could hold the score if she feels that's the best tactic for her. I suppose that's part of the key to EPE team tactics is not to panic because of the disparity sometimes between the quality of the fighters. You know it's going to come in swings and roundabouts. Absolutely. In, in all team matches, not just in EPE, it's... You know, there are going to be fights where one fencer will score a lot of hits off the other and that other fencer has to keep their head and think about what their job in the team is. And often the job in the team of the number three is just to beat the opposing number three in the last fight. And if they can just pick up a few hits on the way there, then that's great. Horvath stepped into the flesh attack, tried to block it out, managed to do so, but no score because her hit was after the fencers had physically touched and the referee called halt at that point. Two hit cushion. Mary Cohn being a little bit more cautious, waiting for that moment to counter to, uh, to flesh attack. And I think she senses Horvath is waiting for the flesh and was wanting to counter attack into it. And there it is. They both did exactly that action and got a double light. So you could say they either both got it right or they both got it wrong. It doesn't matter. It's a point each. Crowd getting a bit more into it now. The stamping of the feet. I think in this situation where Mary knows Horvath is looking for the flesh. Because Horvath's a bit lighter and sharper on her feet than the Devereux, Mary's first opponent. She needs to do more, use more change of distance, not just on the spot, holding the same distance, but more in and out to deceive her opponent. Again, she did the flesh, Horvath did the counter-attack, same action. So it's clear what their tactics are. It's really, can they find the right distance and the right, just pick the moment, the perfect moment to go for it. Horvath is definitely a counter-attacking fencer. And as I said earlier against Hannah Lawrence, she did look like that's how she wanted to fence, but felt she had to chase a little bit more in that fight. Nice timing that time. Slight difference there. Mary did a feint, stepped back, Horvath then stepped in in response, and that's when Mary changed direction into the flesh attack. And she also went down to the wrist rather than going to the body. It's a good little change of tactic and very subtle change for Mary, but it made a big difference there in the timing of the flesh.
So now she is going a little bit more in and out. As I was saying earlier, not just holding the same distance, but changing the distance. Trying to draw her opponent in for that perfect timed flesh that she wants to deliver. Horvath doesn't really seem to have an aggressive action that's effective. She's just waiting to feed off Mary Cohen's timing. She's doing the occasional step with the fame. She's not really tried to deliver an aggressive hit. Now in a situation where you're leading, that's fine. In a situation where you're having to pick up hits, maybe not. That time, a nice little short flesh to the arm from Horvath pulls one back. I think a slight attack of the commentator's curse there, where I said that she didn't have an effective aggressive action, effective aggressive action and she pulled out a nicely timed flesh to the arm. Again, the same action. Mary Cohen flashes. Horvath counterattacks. Two lights. Mary content to let these this fight double out, and she just needs to reach 20 and just keep that lead. Small though it is, it's a vital lead for England. 40 seconds to go in this leg. The fourth of nine. Oh, lovely hit to the wrist there. Mary stepped in. Horvath came forward, and Mary just stepped back and just angled the point in under the guard. Just caught her opponent on the hand. Very difficult hit to score that. Needs absolute pinpoint accuracy. Uh, and you've got to think that England are going to be very happy with the way the score is ticking along here. We're not reaching the end of rounds um, and time is going to be counting down for Australia. Um, yeah, I think for England in this situation there's two, there's two options. They can try and keep that lead by playing the non-combativity game or they can keep their positive intent and just try and maintain the lead by doubling out these fights. And either way, as long as they take that three-hit cushion into the last couple of rounds pressure will be exerted on Australia to chase and that's when England can start to pick up a bigger lead by feeding off uh, the fact that Australia have to be more aggressive. So Devereux who opened the match and will close the match for Australia um, is now on the piece with the left hand of Radford who again has taken up her position on the extreme left side to block out the attack to the outside of her arm. Well, that was a good deep attack from Radford but she just caught the guard on the way in and that slowed down her action and gave Devereux time to counter-attack. You'll see the referee keeping an eye on Amy Radford's feet as well, making sure she's not stepping off the piste. Obviously, if she puts her foot off the piece, he'll call halt. Devereux lost balance there. She went for lunge. Amy stepped back, tried to counter it. But during the lunge, Devereux just lost balance and came off the piste. And Devereux seems to have a good hand, but her footwork's not quite as sharp as Horvath and Goo in the Australian team. She's got nice timing and a good hand, but she's not quite so mobile. Her lunge not quite so powerful and stable. Amy, kind of a little bit on the spot at the moment. Devereux trying to move in and out, change distance. Doing some reconnoitering there. Drew with the Radford counter-attack and tried to hit the wrist with a step back, but Amy was content to take a double from that. 21-19. And that time, Devereux timed a really nice lunge. And that hit was all about timing. It wasn't really fast. It wasn't kind of electrifying speed that got the hit. It was really clever time, just waiting for the perfect moment. That time she tried the same action, but her distance was just half a step longer. And that gave Radford the, the time to reach out and hit the wrist on the way. Just, I think she wasn't patient enough there. The previous time she delivered the same hit, she was a little bit more patient during the, the build-up and the preparation just established perfect distance before delivering the lunge. Nice hit from Radford. Surprise lunge over the top to the arm. Rebuilds that three hit cushion. And again the, the score's ticking over. It looks again like we'll reach the 25 target. So the clock at the moment not paying a big part but I think as we get nearer the end Australia will start to feel the time pressure once they're, if they're still behind. A good attack on preparation is Devereux just came into distance, a little bit indecisive there. She didn't seem to have a plan as she came in. Closed in too quickly and Radford had plenty of time to do a fast lunge and hit her on the preparation. She looks in control now, Amy Radford. She's a very composed um, athlete. She's always very calm. Looking for the blade that time, Radford, looking for the carp parry. But her timing wasn't quite right. Devereux deceived it. And three hit cushion still. Oh, nice parry post. Radford tried the counter parry, but 
Pedro came through the, the parry in time to get one light. That's nice movement from Radford, just making Devereux fall short there. And I think next time, the same action she maybe will lure Devereux a slightly closer distance and try the counter-attack. And there it is. You called it and she went for it. 25-22 to England then. And the fifth fight down. Still with a minute on the clock. I think that last hit was really important because Amy just dropped a couple of hits. She'd pulled out a four-hit cushion and then Devereux had come back to within two. And then Amy spent a good 15-20 seconds setting up that last... You can spend a lot of time setting up just, just one strike because it can be so important. I mean, we saw Georgina Usher do that in the individual event when she took her gold medal. Absolutely. I mean, Georgina is absolute pinnacle of patience in Epe. And, you know, her whole game is based on the sort of Hungarian style, which is very much you wait for the perfect moment to do something before you do it. And you fence kind of what we call open eyes. So that means you're watching your opponent's movement and distance and watching their patterns of fencing and watching their technique. Um, you're not going in with a kind of fixed plan that you're going to execute. You have to be very adaptable and have to be, uh, have fantastic reactions and program those motor reflexes over thousands of hours of lessons and training. It's a very tough mental way to fence. You have to be strong upstairs. If you're not, you know, you, you lose patience and then that, that style will fall apart. So it's really all about programming it technically, but also having a, a really tough competitive mentality. So Gu, we saw earlier on, likes to wait a little bit and then launch a flesh attack. She launched a few in the previous round. So I think what we're seeing here is Hannah Lawrence picked that up and she's fencing at a little bit longer distance, just half a step when Gu's on the offensive. And that gave her the time on that first hit to just pull out the counter-attack. So she's taking a slightly different approach to, uh, to Radford. So I think it's a sensible move. Just uh, briefly to give you a quick update from the uh, other bronze medal match that's happening in the men's spoil, Singapore versus Australia, and it's just a narrow lead for Singapore, 20 points to 19. And they're getting the fifth round of fights underway in that particular match. So one back for Gu. That time Hannah, when Gu did the flesh, instead of counting into it, she did a power cost. She didn't find the blade, but this time, exactly the same action. Gu is really trying to set the same hit up over and over again. This time Hannah got the distance right and got a really nice circular power post. So this is leg number six. This match has moved on really, really rapidly. It's been an interesting battle. I think for me, uh, the limitation of the Australian team is that Gu is quite one-dimensional. That's her action we just saw there that she likes to do. Um, and Horvath is more of a counter-attacker. So what that does is if they're under pressure, it means that if the other team works out Gu and doesn't attack Horvath too much, then they can put themselves in a very strong position. I think the English team has a little bit more range of actions available to them. And Lawrence, as you can see, keeping slightly longer distance. They just eked it out to a four-point lead then. Yeah, and it's just starting to edge to the point in the match now. Five-point lead now. As again, Gu tried to set the same action up. Anna was ready, hit her on the wrist on the way in and pulls out a five hit cushion. So now if they go into leg number seven with this kind of deficit, which it looks likely that they will, not certain of course, but likely, then the time pressure starts to tell because they know they're running out of fights where they can pull this back. So the England team are looking pretty relaxed over in their corner. Having seen the way that the Australians have fed, oh, that was a better timed attack. She just closed distance a little bit before launching the flesh that time. So one back, just over a minute 15 left and four hit cushion for the England team. Having seen the way that the Australians are fencing and their different styles, um, I think their finishing order, looking at their finishing order, that maybe they felt they would have a slight deficit at this time because Horvath is on uh, third last, followed by Gu, followed by Devereux. So they've put the more defensive fencer on third last. So giving themselves a bit of attacking option at the end. It looks like Amy Reynolds is going to be coming on. That's true. Amy Reynolds is the one back. Yeah, we did see uh, the Australian coach having a quick chat with Andrea Horvath. So maybe just explaining to her his thinking. I think it's going to be the yeah. change. I think it's exactly that. Horvath is 
a good defensive counter-attacking fencer, but the situation, Australia, although they're close to three hits, still have a deficit. That was nicely timed for Lodge. She waited for Gu to step in and then just did a disengage around the blade, lunge for the body, finished that leg with a four-hit cushion. So yeah, the, that substitution I think is a, is a wise move by the Australian coach because Horvath wants to feed off her opponent attacking and the England girls don't really have any reason to attack her with that four-hit cushion. So he has turned to Reynolds on the bench and ha asked her if she can pull back a deficit for them. Quite liberating, I suppose, knowing that that's why you're being brought in, is to go on the attack, you know exactly what your strategy has to be. Yeah, I mean, I think Reynolds is going to be using a little bit a little bit more of the blade action than Horvath. She'll be looking to take Amy Radford's blade out of the way. She's, again, right-hander against left-hander, so she has to watch the angles on her arm. Amy Reynolds is 20 years old, says her ambition is to go to the Olympics at Rio, and if not there, then Tokyo. Yeah, same age as uh, Amy Radford. Reynolds has quite a, a wide on guard position, kind of looks like she's with her hand position as well, that she's always looking around the wrist at the moment with some feints. Distance is quite close. They came together at the same time, blades clash, no light came up, and Radford's hand speed was better, and the left hander managed to replace her point over the top and get one light before Reynolds could react. Reynolds not taking the, the tactic on that I thought she might. I thought she might come in more aggressively and try and take the Radford blade out of the way and then launch some attacks. It is early days in this leg, but there's a five-hit cushion. There we go, that's the parry pos blade action that we were talking about earlier. Radford went for the counter-attack again, but this time Reynolds stepped back out of the way, did a, a semi-circular parry and hit her opponent. So one back for Australia. A nice timing from Radford. She just let Reynolds launch the attack to her foot. In the last second tweaked her foot out of the way and then launched her counter lunge. Reynolds couldn't do anything, she was off balance and distance was wrong and really got drawn into that one by Radford. That was a nice hit. It's a fairly high risk attack going going low and going for the, the foot strike. It is a high risk one. I mean if you if you miss there's a big window of opportunity for the other fencer to, to launch their counter attack. That one was on the floor and I think that's correctly called that time back Kapashvari. Reynolds parried uh, and Amy Radford then just touched the floor on the way past, so uh, the hit registered, but not a valid hit. Nice hit. Radford took the blade that time, so Reynolds couldn't counter-attack as, as Radford came forward and lunged. That's the right tactic, I think, again, and she did it from slightly better distance. And lovely, lovely lunge. Radford on top now in this. Reynolds hasn't so far been able to do the job that the coach needed from her. England just accelerating away in the seventh fight with a seven point lead. And there it is. Nice feint and then disengage over the top, hit to the wrist. Really good leg from Radford. Yeah, she took that 5 1 and that's going to put them in a very comfortable position. I it suggest. is. It is, yeah. And it's a tough call as a coach, you know, making that substitution. It's one of those things you're damned if you do and damned if you don't, you know. So he, he made a brave decision. I think tactically, you know, it probably was the right thing to do. But. At the end of the day, Radford was just too strong for Reynolds. Had a good little change of tactic towards the end of the leg. And England go into the last uh, two rounds with an eight-hit cushion. And Australia now really under pressure to chase. The one positive they have is that Goo likes to pull that flesh attack out, as does Mary Cohen, actually. So we might see people flushing at each other for the next three minutes here. We have had the odd occasion where both fences flush at the same time and there's a bit of a head clash. So hopefully that won't happen. Yeah, I've just seen some traffic advice from the crowd which said stick him with the pointy end. <laughs> Ta it's all about technique. <laughs> it's all about technique. And Mary's been watching Goo earlier in this match. She knows that Goo wants to flesh over the top to the top of her arm or the, the shoulder area. And she was just ready with that circular power post. Drew Goo into the flesh and did a very good power post. And that time... She tried the parry, missed it, but was really, really sharp to step back out of the way and hit over the top on the wrist. Very intelligent fencing from Mary. Yeah, and a 10-point lead now. And there's Mary's flash. 11. And Goose tried two of those attacks. Mary scored off both, and now Mary shows her how it's done with a nice timed attack. I mean, they will have seen Mary Cohen do this in the earlier fight, um, of course, but... Uh, no answer to that flesh as yet. 
No, the problem is for Gucci, she needs to press forward and score. And by doing that, she's playing into Mary's hands, who wants to flash onto her preparation. So it's, it's a tough situation for Gu. 11 hit cushion. This leg is almost concluded. It is concluded in 42 seconds. And England in complete control of this bronze medal match after a very composed performance. Yeah, Australia have managed just three hits uh, in the last uh, three fights, I think it is. Um, and that, that's a pattern you do see sometimes where one team is very slightly better than the other and the slightly weaker team manages to hold on for the first few legs. But then if they have a small deficit towards the end, they, they have that pressure to chase and then the stronger team gets the opportunity to use their technique and score uh, quite heavily off them. So matches that are sometimes you know, 25, 23, 25, 22 can suddenly turn into, a, as we're seeing here, a 40, 30, 40, 28 lead. So here we go with the last leg, ninth leg of nine. Closing for England, Hannah Lawrence. And closing for Australia, Annie Devereaux. Devereaux with an absolute mountain to climb. Just the suggestion that may have registered on the guard of her opponent. I don't know if Hannah Lawrence is being really sporting and saying, I think I hit her guard, or if she actually thought her opponent's light was on, not hers. One or the other. Well, they've tested. The weapon is okay. The rule is that the referee awards the hit. Yeah, even the referee himself is... Um Shrugging his shoulders, not quite sure what was happening there. Yeah, I think Hannah maybe, maybe I might be wrong, maybe got a little bit confused and thought her opponent's light was on, not hers. Devereaux goes for the flesh. Hannah was ready, stepped back out of distance, counter-attacked very nicely. 42-28. England now three hits from the bronze medal to add to the tally of the England squad. And of course the men's uh, foil team will go for gold uh, later on as well. So it could be another successful afternoon for English fencing here in Largs. I think Scotland might have a thing or two to say about that in the men's they, foil They final. might, they might. Nice parry cross. Really, nice. really, really good technique. Solid parry, held the blade until her opponent took a step back and then launched a nice lunge repost. 43-29. Lawrence just seeing this fight out very professionally for the England team. Devereaux is trying everything she can, but it's a bit too much to ask. And England on the brink now, 44-29. And a rapid-fire match. That's it, our teammates stand in unison to applaud her. That was a very commanding performance from first to last. Wire to wire victory, I think they call that. Uh, you know, from that first 5-1 fight by Mary Cohen, um, never really looked in any kind of doubt. They did narrow the gap a little in the, the third and fourth fights, but uh, it, it was all over um, when they started extending that lead in Australia. Just, just couldn't seem to hit the board. Yeah, just the third leg where Goo pulled a few hits back against Amy Radford, and they closed to within two, and then that gap stayed two or three hits for the next leg or two, and then Australia started to feel the pressure of the fights running out, the time running out, and they needed to try and score. Um, the coach made that substitution, pulling off Horvath, the counter-attacking timing fencer, feeling that she didn't really have time to play her game because England weren't going to come on to her. Uh, and he tried everything he could, I think, there for his team. And the, obviously the Australian fencers fenced their heart out. But in the end, England just had a bit too much depth, I think. As I said at the beginning of that match, all four of the of the girls are very very strong fences there isn't really a weak link in the team um, and they all just showed that there with some good changes of tactics good changes of distance and a good understanding of if they made a mistake what they needed to do immediately to correct that and I think that's so important you know in all fencing matches and we sometimes see when people lose their head a little bit they make a mistake and then repeat that mistake two or three times you know, everyone makes mistakes, but if, if you put it right immediately, then that's the sign of a good fencer. Uh, what do you think will be going through the minds of the Australian team? Because, I mean, you know, they've made this bronze medal match, um, but if you look back at, the, let's say, the results from the their own um, home uh, Commonwealth Games in 2010, a yeah. lot of Australian teams, a lot of goals, you know, they were yeah. very much there or thereabouts in every competition. Do they see this as a, a chance for the younger fighters to get, a, to, to get a, you know, some sort of experience? Cause it seems they seem to have fallen off a little bit. They've only picked up one bronze in the entire yeah. championship so far. I think there's two things, really. I think one is 
Um, that, to be honest, they haven't got all of their strongest fences here. They've got a lot of their best fences here. There are some of their strongest fences missing. And actually, in this team, Halls is missing, who picked up a decent result in the individual competition. Um, so she came fifth, I think, in the individual. So that was obviously going to have a huge impact because she would have been their big gun. They would have probably had her closing the match. They would have expected to be within two or three hits, not seven or eight behind. And then it could have been a different story. So that has a huge impact if you lose your, your main player. Um, I think, you know, there is a suggestion that maybe they haven't developed over the last four years as they would have liked. And I haven't seen a lot of young Australian fences out on the, the circuit or the Junior World Championships in recent years. So there is a suggestion of that maybe... You know, I, I, I'm not an expert on Australian fencing, but st structurally, I think there might be some issues there. And they, you know, they do need to look, I think, to the future and develop some more young fencers. Taking a leaf out of the Singapore book, who have been fielding really young fencers with really good technique, who have produced some fantastic performances. Well, that's the bronze medal match for the women's team at EPI. Then England wrapping it up with a fairly convincing victory. Just the first commentary, of course, for tonight. We're going to be back with more Team uh, Women's Epi match, uh, gold medal match, uh, at half past six. And then following that, we have the final event of the Commonwealth Fencing Championships. And that will be the men's uh, team foil, Scotland versus England. Not one to be missed. <laughs>